Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Today's Gospel reading is taken from the Gospel according to St. John. But for us to be able to understand the liturgy's gospel, we have to go back and look carefully to the Vespers gospel. Last night's gospel, the Vespers, was taken also from the book of John, just a few verses before the verses that we read today. Last night, the gospel was taken from the book of John, chapter 6, verse 15 to 21. And today is a continuation from 21 to 27, from the same chapter. Because there is a great foundation that the Holy Spirit established through the readings of the church from last night and built on top of it today's gospel. And the combination of the two gospels readings, simply the story of our salvation altogether. Today, the Lord Jesus Christ is revealing a fact about him and he doesn't want people to follow him just because they ate from the fish and the bread he's elevating them from the level of being earthly to the level of being divine telling them well someone like moses can give you food in the wilderness i can send anyone to give you food that's not a big deal As a matter of fact, I am the provider of all the richness that you are living in. But I am here for something that's more important. I am here to save you. I am here to give you the money that's coming from heaven that without it, you perish. And with it, you can live eternally. But to do that, you need to understand something very important. And because St. John in his gospel, he focused on the divinity of Christ. Any miracle that you read in the gospel of St. John is focused on the divinity of Christ. It's telling us who Christ is. Yes, he is a son of man. Yes, he is the Messiah that has been long waited by the Jews. But more importantly, he is divine. He is God incarnate. So in last night's reading, we read in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6, verse 15 to 21, about the miracle of walking on water and saving the disciples from the storm of the Sea of Galilee. Let's go and study this miracle carefully. What happened is, The Lord Jesus Christ was with his disciples on the shore. He performed the miracle of feeding the multitude. Then people wanted to make him a king. Well, that's a great king. That's the best of them all. We can just sit, relax, and he will feed us food for free. It can't get better than that. That's the king we always wanted, someone to feed us. Well, we will sit and listen to him talking. So the Lord Jesus Christ sensed that, and he noticed that they want to take him to make him a king. So he told his disciples, you leave now. I want you to take the boat and leave, and I will take care of the multitude. So, I want you to remember that he ordered his disciples to leave to the Sea of Galilee. And he is God. He knows everything. He knows the past, the present, and the future. He knew quite well that just a little bit later, his disciples would be tossed in the storm in the Sea of Galilee, suffering from a huge storm and sea um, uh, disturbance. Yet he told him to go there. He knew it. Yet he told him to go there. He set them up for that, for this temptation, for this trial, for this tribulation, to be in the middle of the sea in dark night with a storm. There is a reason. There is a divine reason for that. More than just a miracle, 
that you know later on he will just walk in the water and save them. Uh, it's not a show off, right? Yeah, go to the storm, I'll come, like you know, uh, and save you. No, 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 no. That is so different than that. Just bear with me to understand the divine wisdom behind it. Why Jesus will do that? Why would he send his disciples to the middle of the storm, to the middle of the sea, at the middle of the night, to torture them before he will go and save them? He knew it. He could have, he could have told them, you know, like wait here till the morning, and the morning we'll leave together. But he didn't do that. He meant to do that. And he meant all the circumstances. He meant the disciples, he meant the boat, he meant the sea, he meant the darkness, and he meant, he meant <clears throat> the middle of the night. He stayed on shore, and he sent the multitude away. Then he did something very remarkable. He went up on the mountain, and when you read this miracle, you read it in three Gospels, and you can put all the facts together. St. Matthew, St. Mark, and St. John mentioned the story. Everyone mentioned some details. If you read them together, you can uh, understand the whole story altogether. So he went up on the mountain to pray. Jesus' prayers is not like anybody's prayers. His prayer is simply that he's uniting with God the Father. He becomes one with God the Father in his prayers. He prays to God because that's what they always do. The Father and the Son is in continuous communication all the time. So going up on the mountain, be careful with the details. Up on the mountain, he did not pray on the shore. He did not pray in, on the sea, at sea. He went up on the mountain, and he prayed. Later, the disciples are tortured in the middle of the sea with huge waves, big storm, threatened to kill them right there, to lose their lives. And all of a sudden, they see a ghost that they cannot tell that he is Christ. They saw Christ, but they thought he's a ghost, so they got very frightened. Then they accepted him in the boat. And once they accepted him in the boat, the storm comes to an end, and they find themselves all of a sudden on the seashore, safe and sound. This whole story is simply the story of salvation. Mountains are always a symbol in the Holy Bible to the high places where God is. We say we raise up our eyes to the mountain where we receive our comfort and our help. God is always on high places and he is mentioned in the Bible several times that he is above the mountains. So here the Lord Jesus Christ, after people on earth wanted to make him a king, the Jews was looking for a king to reign over Israel, to give Israel freedom from the Romans, and for them to rule over the earth. That's all what they care about, the earth, earthly kingdom. But God's plan is different. He doesn't want to be a king here on earth. He wants to be the king of our hearts up in eternity and forever, because any earthly kingdom will come to an end one day, sooner or later. There's only one kingdom that's eternal, one everlasting kingdom, which is the kingdom of heaven. And there is one everlasting king who will reign forever, who is Jesus Christ. So he told him, no, I don't want to be a king here on earth. Jews, listen to me. You are seeking an earthly king while I'm here to be someone else. So he sent him away. He rejected this kingdom here on earth. Then. While he is on the mountain, as a symbol of the Lord Jesus Christ, up in heaven, one with the Father, knowing that his disciples, all of us, are being tortured, subject to death, in the sea of this world, waiting for our end to come, so disturbed, the world's waves tossing us around, right, left, and center. And death is our fate right there. 
Yet Jesus Christ, who is up on the mountain, the mountains of heaven, with the Father, decides to come down from his glory, from his unity with, his, with the Father. Notice something. If the Lord Jesus Christ was praying with God the Father, now the disciples in the middle of this mess, will he leave his prayers and go down to save them? Think about it. Think of yourself. You are praying, and all of a sudden you hear something. What would you do? Would you leave your prayers to go and save people whom you ha you're hearing their voices out there? Or you would say, oh, no, well, I'm praying now, should I leave God and save people? That, will, that might upset God, right? Think about it. It's kind of a difficult question. Will I leave my prayer, go out to save people, or stick with my prayer and stay with God? I'll leave you to answer this question. But I'll tell you what Jesus did. He actually left his prayers. He left his God the Father on the mountain in heaven and went down to his disciples, went down to us. He was incarnate and became man. And he went down to the sea of this world to save us, to save his disciples, whom he, from the beginning, put us in the world. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one who created us, and he's the one who sent us to this world. Yes, he sent his disciples intentionally to the sea, knowing what's going to happen. There was no surprises. God knows it all. God created man, put him in the world, knowing quite well that he will be tortured in the world, he will, be, uh, he will suffer in the world, but he said, I will come to you. I will come to save you from your sufferings. Because when I come to you to save you from your sufferings, I can take you to the safe seashore where there will be no suffering and you will be with me. From the beginning, Christ was not in the boat. He was on the mountain. He was in heaven. But when he saw his disciples in this difficulty, he left his high position. He left his God the Father. And he came down, walked on water. Walking on water simply defies all the gravity laws, all the physics, all the science, which is exactly what happened in his incarnation. The Lord Jesus Christ was incarnate not in a natural way, in a supernatural way, exactly as when he walked on water in a supernatural way. He did not go to the boat in another boat. He did not come to earth through normal conception or through normal birth like any child. He came in a supernatural miracle. And also he went to his disciples who were in the boat in a supernatural condition or way. He walked on water. And he walked on water and although he walked towards his own disciples, whom they lived with him, whom know him very well, they did not recognize him. As exactly when the Lord Jesus Christ was incarnate and became one of us, we people, men of this world, did not recognize him. And many thought he is someone else. Many thought that he's Elijah, or John the Baptist rose from the dead, or one of the prophets, or just an earthly king, or a criminal, or a liar. They accused him of all many things, exactly like the disciples looked at him and thought that he's just a ghost. What's a ghost? No one knows what a ghost is. And that's what they looked at, and that's what they thought he is. Jesus Christ, they didn't know that he's Jesus. They thought he's a ghost and got frightened. Exactly like we men, the priests, the archpriests, the Pharisees, and the Romans, got frightened from Jesus Christ. Although he didn't come with an army, he didn't come with a loud voice, he came in humbleness as a baby in a manger in Bethlehem, a poor carpenter, a human being, very humble. He had all his glory and his honor. He walked among us like one of us, yet people got very scared from him. Herod the king, when he stood be, 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 uh, in front of Jesus Christ and asked him, who are you? Are you the Messiah? And he said, yes, I am. He was so frightened. The soldiers who went to Gethsemane to capture him, 
and he is alone, unarmed, a poor carpenter, and they came with sticks and swords to capture him and to arrest him. And they asked him, we are here looking for Jesus Christ, and said, here I am. And they got frightened, they went back, and they fell on the ground in fear. Because he is indeed, he is our Lord, so fearful and powerful. But in his humbleness, he doesn't want to scare us. So he told his disciples, peace to you, do not be frightened. I am here not to frighten you. I am here to save you. And the Lord Jesus Christ in his humbleness is telling every single one of us, do not be scared of me. Do not be frightened of me. I came to you even if you don't recognize me. Many people till today don't recognize the Lord Jesus Christ and they think that he is scary. He's going to punish us by throwing us in hell. He's not going to do that. He is not a ghost walking on water. He's a loving father, a loving God. He came walking in water for us, not to scare us, so don't get scared, but rather to bless us and to give us inner peace. And he's telling you, don't be scared of me. I'm your heavenly father. The worst worship ever is the worship that's based on fear. When people come to church out of fear, when people pray out of fear, when people uh, uh, pay donations out of fear, otherwise God will do something to them to take the money out of them by force. God doesn't do that. God doesn't do that. Let's stop thinking that God is a fearful ghost walking on water. He's a loving father taking us in his bosom and comfort us. Do not be scared. Don't be afraid. I am he. I am he. Know me. I'm the one who can mend your wounds, mend your broken heart. I'm the one who can give you inner peace. I'm the one who can give you inner joy. I'm the one who comforts you. Just come to me and trust me. I will do miracles for you. I will walk in the middle of the storm with you. I will walk on water for you. Just trust me. The Lord Jesus Christ telling everybody today, trust me. And once you accept me in your life, in your boat, you will find yourself out of the storm, out of the roaring sea, peacefully sitting on the seashore with no fear and no pain, no storms. Many people still live in the storm till today and many people don't recognize the lord jesus christ and there is one verse that many people struggle with in this miracle when they see the lord jesus christ walking towards the boat and then the bible says attempting to pass them he walked to the boat and then he started to pass them without entering the boat because that's what the Lord Jesus Christ does with us. He comes so close to us, but he will never force himself into the boat. He will wait for you to accept him willingly. And that's exactly the word that's used in the Bible. Willingly. The disciples willingly accepted him into the boat. And the moment he entered the boat, the storm calmed and they found themselves on the seashore. The Lord Jesus Christ will just come closer to you. If you recognize him and willingly invite him to take control of your life, to be in your life, to be in your boat, the storm will come to an end and you'll be in peace. The Lord Jesus Christ in his relationship with us exactly like, um, you know, in some companies for any check to be cashed, Two people have to sign the check. That's exactly our story with God. For us to cash the goodness of God, the salvation of God, the protection of God, the peace of God, and all the goodness that God offers us, two signatures must be on that check, our life check. The first signature is the Lord's signature, and he signed on blank checks for us. 
and he signed with his own blood on the cross and gave us those checks. Every single one of us who entered into the baptism font was given at that day a check from God, a check for salvation, for all goodness, for eternal life, for reigning with him in heaven, signed by the blood of him, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that check will never work will never be able to be cashed, will never, you will never be able to benefit from unless you put your signature on the second line of this check. And once you sign it, the check now is valid. The Lord Jesus Christ did all his best, did all what he can do, came to you to the boat, unless you give him permission to bless you. He will not bless you unless to surrender to his guidance, he will not guide you. Unless you accept his commandments, his commandments will not be valid. We have to accept him fully with our hearts, with our minds, all our lives, with everything, surrender completely to him and say, come Lord Jesus Christ in my boat. Salvation is not something that happens in one moment and it's done. No. Salvation is something that goes through all my life. All my life, the Lord Jesus Christ has to be in the boat of my life. The moment he will step out of the boat, the moment the boat will start to sink, then I have no help around me because the only help who can, who I can receive is the help of the Lord Jesus Christ. No one else can save the disciples from the storm. No one else can come walking on water. No one else can in a fraction of a second take the boat from the center of the sea and bring it back to the shore. No one else can do that. Only Lord Jesus Christ, who is the comfort of the fainted heart, who is the, the, the doctor and the physician of all the broken hearts, and all the wounded people. He is the king of all of us. He is the savior of all of us. He is the lover of mankind. And he is there for us, wishing, wanting us to invite him into our life, to take control of our life, inviting us to come into our boat so our boat might settle on the seashore in peace. If we let him, he will. If we don't let him, he will just pass away from the boat, walk on his way, and the boat will stay in the storm of this world and eventually will sink. We pray that God will never abandon to us, will open our minds and lines our hearts so that we might see him not as a ghost but as a savior and invite him to the boat, not only to save us from the storm of the sea, but to stay with us till we stay with him ever uh, in eternity. Glory be to God for him ever and ever. Amen. Oh,